Okay, so last time control history, then we did kind of the deterministic optimal control problem. And then we talked about Pontryagin's principle, we'll call it, because minimum or maximum is a matter of uh, interpretation there. And then we started talking about the LQR problem, right? The linear quadratic regulator problem, which um, we will we will be talking about for like all of today for sure, and then probably most of next time as well, because it's it's just that awesome. It's really really pretty great. Um, so let's see. Today we're going to talk about. Um, really lots of LQR, basically. Uh, in particular, we're going to do, um, we're going to use the shooting, indirect shooting stuff that we talked about last time to solve the LQR problem first. Um, then we're going to sort of take a closer look at LQR, at the LQR problem, and we're going to um, look at it as a QP, a quadratic program, like you've got on your homework, right? And then um, hopefully we'll have time. We're going to then kind of dig into the structure of that QP. When I say structure, I mean specifically sparsity pattern structure in the matrices that make up the QP. And sparse matrices are kind of, there's a lot you can get out of, of looking at stuff like this. So turns out if you kind of like look inside those matrices and look at the, the bands in the matrices, you can do some cool things. And um, you can pull out this thing called the Riccati recursion. So we're gonna start talking about that today and probably um, follow up next time with some more on that. Um, and we're basically gonna do, we're gonna like, get to the LQR problem like three different ways. There's sort of several ways of interpreting it and deriving it. And it's a super deep result that like shows up all over control and is super, super practically useful as well. So we will spend a good amount of time on it. So first off, just as a review, to kind of like pick up where we left off, let's kind of write down the LQR problem again. So we've got in discrete time, which we're gonna pretty much stick to now, we're good. Uh, we've got our state trajectory and our input trajectory sampled. We've got our cost function. And in the LQR case, it has a quadratic cost. Uh, so that's the Q in LQR. And that looks like this. And um, you can have time varying cost weights or not. Like we talked about time variant versus time invariant LQR. So if I write it down with the little Ks on the Q and R here, that's potentially time varying. Uh, and then we have a terminal cost term. And then we've got linear dynamics constraints. So XK plus one equals AK XK plus BK UK. And again, yeah, the A's and B's, they can be time varying. That's what you would get in, for example, a trajectory tracking problem, uh, or they could be time invariant, they'd be constant for all time, which is what you would get if you're trying to like stabilize an equilibrium point, like a balancing problem or something like that, right? Um, and then the last thing is that the matrices in here, uh, the Q's have to be positive semi-definite and the R's have to be strictly positive definite. We kind of talked about it intuitively last time, that's coming from in the cost function, right? If for example, you had R equals zero, then the optimal thing to do would be to just jack the U's up to infinity to minimize the, the, the X cost as quickly as you can, right? So this cost function from last time, remember, it's saying to drive the X's and the U's to zero. So it's trying to drive the state of the system to the origin as basically as fast as possible while minimizing the overall control effort. And so what you're, the goal here is to get the, the state to the origin and then stop, right? And so if R is zero, then the optimal thing is to just 
jack up the controls to infinity to get to the origin in zero time and, and therefore it becomes like an ill posed problem. Um, yeah, that's kind of the idea. So that's why those things are there intuitively. And we'll see later on mathematically, it shows up where you, you essentially have to invert R in some places. So therefore it has to be convertible full rank all that stuff. Okay, any questions about that? That's the setup from last time. Um, some notes, some more notes on this, just like as I think we were kind of like saying, I was saying random things about this and how it's awesome. Uh, there's a couple other things. I'd, um, so we talked about time varying versus not. The, the big idea here, the reason we spend so much time on this and it's super, super useful is that this is obviously linear and simplified in a bunch of ways, right? Um, but this is a really good local approximation for a ton of nonlinear control problems. So it turns out very often we, we can have a super nonlinear robotic system. It turns out that like if you linearize it locally, either about a fixed point, like for a balancing problem or um, about a trajectory that you found, uh, you can apply LQR and it works super, super well in practice. So it is actually super practically useful. So it is useful in nonlinear systems. Um, it also, uh, as we will see, has basically has a closed form solution. So it's a thing we can actually solve. So it's super tractable computationally. Um, it also has a bunch of interesting extensions. So this version that we wrote down here is discrete time and finite horizon, meaning that it has a finite number of time steps. There's a bunch of other extensions of this that we'll get into, so um, that are useful sometimes. So for example, there's, which we'll talk about a little bit today, there's an infinite horizon version. We take a limit as n goes to infinity. There's also uh, a stochastic generalization of this where you have noise and uncertainty on your state and things like that. Um, and there's, there's many, many other kind of tweaks to the setup here. You can do game theoretic versions of this with adversarial agents. You can do uh, communication limited versions of this. There's uh, pretty, it goes really deep. There's sort of a lot of tricks you can play. In. And it's, it's really kind of, this is the playground of control theory because it is tractable. You can do analytic stuff. You can get close form answers and stuff. Um, and yeah, on that note, this has been, it is sort of like been called the crown jewel of control theory. It's super practically useful. You can get nice theoretical results. It is, it is a good thing. So worth, worth our time. Okay, so the first thing I want to do here is, last time we talked about Pontryagin, I like it stuff, and um, uh, we, you know you can actually use that as essentially gradient descent. So we're going to do that on the LQR problem. So I'm going to kind of write down what it looks like uh, on this particular problem, and then we'll do it real quick. And I mentioned last time that this doesn't really work so well. Uh, so we'll try it this way first, and then we'll we'll try it another couple ways later in the lecture and kind of compare. So if you remember last time, um, let's see, I should write down like the, these guys first. So we had um, from the indirect shooting stuff, uh, I'll just write it down and you kind of can go back and plug in and like derive these from the definitions. We had this kind of, you know, Hamiltonian business. And uh, in general, it looks like this. For the LQR problem, if we plug all this in, it's just the dynamics, right? So this is just AX plus BU. Then we had uh, the Lagrange multipliers. And in this case, if we plug everything in and uh, it turns out in the LQR problem, it's Q X K plus A transpose lambda K plus one. I guess here I'm going to do the time invariant case for this just to make life easier and have less bookkeeping for this particular example. And then for the U's, um, we've oh, also we have lambda N here. 
turns out is qn xn. And then the u's before, remember we had this sort of minimization from last time to find the u's. So this was like uk equals argmin over some u tilde thing of the Hamiltonian like this. Uh, subject to control limits. It turns out in the LQR case, there are no control limits, right? You just have quadratic costs. So it turns out in the LQR case, we can actually solve that min in closed form. And if you plug in sort of the matrices and work it out, it's pretty easy. It turns out it's minus R inverse B transpose lambda K plus one. Uh, okay. Questions about this. And it turns out actually, we're doing gradient descent here. This, this in the algorithm, this is actually delta u, I should say. It's sort of the, the incremental delta u. This is like really the gradient with respect to u that we're going to use as our method for improving things. Um, okay, so that's sort of the plugging everything in for the direct shooting stuff. The sort of overall procedure for actually minimizing here is to number one, start with an initial guess trajectory. So an initial guess for, well, you have the initial state and then you have a guess for the use, right? The controls that we're solving for. Okay, so then we're going to simulate a rollout that trajectory with those controls to get an X of T. So simulate the RL word is roll out, right? Okay, um, then we're gonna do the backward pass that's right there to solve for the lambdas and the delta u's. Then we're gonna do uh, a new rollout with a line search on delta u to find our updated use. If you're doing RL, you would probably not do a line search. You would probably do some decaying step length learning rate thing, but we're gonna do line searches in here because they work. Um, and then you have, so once you've done that line search on delta u, you found your new use, and now you're back where you started and you're going to repeat uh, until convergence. Okay, any questions about this basic setup? It's, it's literally gradient descent on the u's. It's just using this fancy forward backward propagation trick to compute the gradients efficiently. That's basically what's going on here. Is that cool with everybody? Okay, so one more thing we're gonna talk about before we actually go do the code. Um, the system we're going to use in pretty much all the examples today is called a double integrator. It's basically the simplest linear system you can write down. Who's heard of a double integrator before? Hands, not that many people. Okay, so then we should definitely spend the time to do this. Okay, so here's what a double integrator is. It's sort of what it sounds like. It is in continuous time, it's X dot, uh, which the state here is gonna be. So if I imagine I have a position and a velocity, that's my state. We're gonna call the position Q, the velocity Q dot. And here the state derivative is Q dot Q double dot. It's literally F equals MA for a particle where the uh, F is your control input. So there's a particle in 1D. The easiest way to think about this, I think the intuitive way is think about a brick sliding on ice in one dimension, frictionless. So it's got a mass and then your control input is just a force applied to the brick, that's it. So if you think about F equals MA in one dimension with no other forces except your control input, that's what this is. Does that make sense, everybody? 
So think brick sliding on ice. If I write that down, um, it's a linear system and it just looks like this. So your state here, Q, Q dot. So this just says Q dot equals Q dot so far. And then our input is applied directly on the, the Q double dot, right? So this just says Q double dot equals U. We're cool with that. So it's just F equals MA, where M is one and F is U. And let's see, if I label some of this stuff, this is position. This is velocity. This is acceleration. And this would be like your force. And the, yeah, the intuitive thing is sliding brick on the ice. Okay, um, cool with that. Yeah. I have a question on the like, Yeah. Uh, what's like the update on We're gonna do, so we start with some U, initial U. We do forward simulation, backward pass to compute delta U. And then we go forward again, and we're gonna do U plus some alpha like line search parameter delta u. So basically doing u plus delta u, but we're backtracking on the delta u, just like before we did line search. That's, that makes sense? Cool. And yeah, we'll, we'll do the code in a sec. So it should be super clear in that. Okay. So the last thing here is we're going to do this in discrete time. Um, so if I just kind of, I, it turns out this is super simple linear system. I can integrate this exactly. So we don't need to use a wrong cut method or anything. And it's going to look like this. That makes sense to everybody. It's like one half AT squared on the in the B matrix, basically. And then um, you know, like QK plus one equals QK plus time step times the velocity. All good. It's pretty easy. And then so these matrices, this is going to be our discrete time A, and this is going to be our discrete time B, as we talked about before. Cool. So super simple. It's one degree of freedom, two-dimensional state space. It's just writing down F equals MA for a particle in 1D in this kind of linear state space form, right? So it's just a little bit of massaging of some very simple stuff and then converting to discrete time here at the, at the end. Okay, should we go do it now? We good? Okay, so let's do, let's do some code. Hey, Zach. Uh, yep. Quick question. What is the H here? Is that the time step? The H, yeah, that's the time step. I can... Okay. Thank you, note. Thanks. Yeah, you got it. Okay, code. Let's do this. Okay. Everyone see that okay? So here we go. Um, here's the discrete time dynamics that we just wrote down, the A and B matrix. And I'm making the time step 0.1 seconds. Nothing crazy. Uh, this is just some bookkeeping stuff. So we have two states, one control input. For now, I'm going to make the final time five seconds. So five seconds at 10 hertz, like 50 time steps, 51 technically, I guess. Um, initial conditions, we're going to start at one meter away from the origin, zero velocity. And remember that the goal here with the cost function, the way I've written it down, is to drive the system to the origin. So we're going to start at rest a meter away. And try to push it to the push the sliding brick to the origin and stop at the origin. Okay. Um, cost functions. We're just going to start here for now. Make this up. Uh, identity for Q. Point one for R. Identity for QM. Nothing. Nothing crazy. Cost function. So this is just me adding up the cost function, aka integrating it along the trajectory in discrete time. So just a sum of the time steps of that LQR cost function that we wrote down. This is my rollout. So this is just forward simulating the dynamics. So AX plus BU, right? Um, 
So I, I give this thing a, um, a state, initial state and a, a control trajectory and it simulates everything. Here's my initial guess. So um, I'm gonna just you know, assume it's at rest, like X naught forever. Um, zeros for the controls. Uh, yeah, nothing interesting. And we'll go ahead and run this. So this is just sitting still, not doing anything. Get some initial cost. Here's the meat of the algorithm. So let's see what's in here. So this is that backward pass. So this is the backward, um, like Pontryagin thing, right? Where we're going backwards and computing the delta U's and the lambdas backward in time, exactly like I just wrote down. So these are really that, like you can think of this as the, the Hamiltonian gradient things from Pontryagin, or or you know, I plug in the um, LQR stuff into that. And this is what I get. So this is going backwards, and then I go forward again with a rollout with a line search. So I start with alpha equals one, I roll it out, I check the cost, and I do the Armijo rule thing on the cost to make sure I get a good cost decrease. The one thing that's kind of interesting here is this, is, it, it turns out this is what that like gradient condition looks like in, in this particular case. If anyone has any, do you want to know like where that comes from or why? Why is that the Armijo like first order, you know, sort of Taylor expansion approximation for the cost decrease here? It's like delta u squared, right? Kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Think about it. Okay, so we go ahead and roll it out with u plus alpha delta u. We check the Armijo stuff and we just chop alpha in half until we get a good, good decrease just like before. Cool. Any questions about all that? All right, so we go ahead and do it. See how it does. So about 600 iterations, 700 iterations. And obviously the cost went down and we think this is about minimum. So I should also mention, yeah, my tolerance is here. I'm gonna do this until I, my, my sort of uh, tolerance is like pretty loose, I think. What I do, like 10, yeah, 10 to the minus two tolerances on everything. So this is not tight tolerances. It's like two digits of accuracy basically. So my cost now is about six and a half. I can plot the trajectory that I get. And you can see I start at one, zero velocity. Um, then I, you know, obviously push the velocity negative to get back to the origin. And I kind of like asymptotically approach, you know, zero position here. Um, I can plot the controls too. You see, I basically get this, you know, it starts out very negative. I'm pushing, you know, toward, to the, to the left towards the origin. And then I basically hit the brakes here, right? And I'm pushing the other way to stop. So I slide to the stop. So this looks pretty reasonable. Um, let's see, what should we do with this? I don't have any requests, change cost functions, change change anything you want. Hey, Zach, uh, could you repeat where this formula for Delta U and the Lambda came from? Yeah, so I just put it like out in the notes. Cake. It's yeah. coming from the Pontryagin minimum principle. So the like, okay. uh, what we did last time where we talked about the Hamiltonian and the, the gradient of it's, yeah, it is, it is the KKT stuff, the, the Pontryagin stuff from last time, which is um, essentially computing the, Remember that the KKT conditions are just gradient equals zero, right? Yeah. So it turns out, right, the, the U terms in there are unsurprisingly the gradient of the cost with respect to U, right? Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, so then the U terms from Pontryagin are giving us the gradient of the cost with respect to U. And we can just go backward along that recursion and get you grad with respect to you. And then we just do gradient descent on that by like going in that gradient is that direction right? with respect to the use. Okay, so that's what's going on. So a couple things to try out. Uh, one thing I can, I can play with the costs and stuff. So we can try, uh, let's see. So um, let me try some, so let's do first, I'm gonna crank the horizon length out a little bit. So let's go with like 10 seconds and see what that does. So remember it took about six, 660 something iterations before let's see what it takes with 10 seconds it's taking a long time is the the takeaway message so it's like 2000 it turns out if i crank this up again if i go to like 20 we'll be sitting here for like 10 minutes it gets really bad as you crank the horizon length up uh, let's look at the solution so yeah super reasonable does kind of what you would expect uh some other things i can do so this is getting to the origin around i don't know four seconds or so I can crank up the cost. So if I, for example, what should happen if I crank R up here? Should it get to the origin faster or slower? Slower, slower right? Okay, let's try that. Is 
it should have a less sort of spiky behavior here, right? So like the controls should, should the peak control effort should be lower, right? So like two and a half, the new one, it's like 0.8, right? So less control effort, get there slower. Cool, so that makes sense to everybody. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, I think that's about, the only other thing to mention here is these, these kind of shooting methods. So I mentioned last time, numerically, they're not great and they're not widely used anymore. And this kind of works because it's an easy linear problem, but on nonlinear problems, these things are nightmarishly hard to get to work. Um, and the, one of the big issues with them, if, if anyone here has done machine learning, you've heard of like the vanishing gradient or exploding gradient problem, which is really saying when you have, when you back prop really far, you end up with ill conditioning in your, in your gradients, right? So the same thing is happening here. So here I'm back propping along that time horizon. So if I make a lot more time steps, I get really bad ill conditioning. In control, this is called the tail wagging the dog problem. It's the same thing. But like if I jack this up to say, like even just 15 seconds, maybe, because I don't want to sit here too long, you'll see that this ends up taking forever to converge. Right? Probably longer than we want to sit here. So that's the takeaway message. Like there's some issues here. It kind of works for really easy stuff, but um, there are much better sort of methods. And that wasn't so bad. Okay. Uh, I think that's about it for me. So onward. All right, so we've seen now LQR via Pontryagin, via this kind of shooting stuff. Yeah. Why is it called indirect shooting? It's called indirect because uh, like we talked about last time uh, in control, if you're solving it via the Pontryagin minimum principle, it's called indirect. Uh, whereas if you sort of, the next thing we're gonna do is direct. So you'll see the difference. So if it uses Pontryagin, it's called indirect. Shooting refers to doing a forward rollout from the initial conditions. It's called shooting for historical reasons. So that's indirect Pontryagin shooting forward rollout. Uh, cool. Question? Yeah. Could we have done like a Newton thing here, like how we did earlier with- Yeah, uh, we're gonna do that right now. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is if you have quadratic costs. So if you have smooth dynamics, smooth costs, yes. Uh, you can get non-smooth things quite easily by for two ways. If you put in like a non-smooth cost function, like if you put in like an L1 norm cost, say, you'll get some non-smooth things probably. Also, if you put in constraints. So are you have you heard of bang bang solutions for optimal control problems? Probably many of you heard of this. That comes from solving a minimum time problem with control limits. So if you take away the R and instead say, I have upper and lower bounds on my control effort. And then you say, get there as fast as you can. The solution to that is unsurprisingly full gas and then full brakes. So that's, that's bang, bang. So that comes from a different setup, right? Where you have hard constraints rather than soft costs on the controls. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, increasing R took longer to get to the order because you're penalizing error. So increasing R, the question was, yeah, like kind of about the cost tuning stuff. If you increase R, you're penalizing con large control effort, right? Okay. So that means it's going gonna, it's gonna to use less control. So it's going to take longer to get there. Similarly, like, I mean, so the thing that matters is the relative sizes of Q and R, right? So if you make R really big, I'm saying like, don't use a lot of effort, control effort. So my Q really big, I'm saying get there really fast. And I basically, I can trade those off. So if I crank both of them up by like the same factor, so if I crank Q and R both up by 10, you get the same answer, right? It's the kind of the ratio that matters. Cool. Okay. Anybody else on Zoom add anything? All good? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, is it possible to like consider the time horizon also as a variable? It is. Um, as soon as you do that, the problems become non-convex. You can still solve them usually. Um, and in some cases there are analytic solutions, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a harder problem. It doesn't sort of fall in this nice LQR category of cleanly solvable things. But yeah, happy to talk more about that stuff if you want. Anybody else? Okay, cool. So here we go. Um, the next thing is gonna be, we're gonna look at, uh, setting up and solving this LQR problem uh, as a QP, as a quadratic program, like you're, you're seeing on the homework and like we talked about a little bit before. So here it goes. All right, so 
let's um, first off assume the initial state, which we'll call uh, x1 here is given, which makes sense. We did that here, right? Um, so in, in particular, what we mean by that is it's not a decision variable. So it's not one of the variables we're optimizing over, right? It's given. So LQR is a type of trajectory optimization? It's a type of, it's a control problem. It's not an algorithm, okay. it's not a, a solution method. It's a, it's a problem definition where you have a quadratic cost function and a linear dynamics function. Uh, okay, so that's that. Now we're gonna define the following vector where we're gonna stack all of the controls and uh, states for all time. Just, we're gonna stack everything up into one giant vector and we're gonna call it Z. So here we're talking about, this has like U1, X2, U2, dot, 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 all the way to XN. So we just take everything for every time step and kind of stack UX, UX, all the way till XN. And then we're gonna define a big, um, uh, like Hessian matrix, we're going to call H. That's kind of the same idea. We're just going to stack block diagonally concatenate all of the Q and R matrices for all the time steps. Uh, so the idea here is H we're going to say is sort of uh, be like R1, Q2, R2, dot, 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 QN. And then zero is everywhere else. So we define this such that the, the cost for the whole LQR problem is just um, so the whole cost is just, remember we defined this in terms of the big sum before over all the time steps. So now we define the Z and this H such that that whole cost is just Z transpose H Z. Does that make sense everybody? We're just stacking up all the time steps in a, in a big vector and then defining the single big matrix H such that the total cost over all the, the whole trajectory is just this big quadratic form instead of writing it out as a sum of time steps. Cool. Yeah. Um, so when we're defining Z, uh, so it goes to U1, X2, Exactly. So X1, we're not optimizing over X1, right? That's given as the initial condition. So that's why it's just, we don't want to, we, we are not minimizing it, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a given. That makes sense? Yeah. There is no UN. That's the other thing, right? So if you remember before, we have an initial state we're given, and then like with in discrete time, at least, you have, you know, initial state, initial control, blah, blah, blah. When you get to the final state, there's no more control move. That you get to make there, right? So un minus one gets you to xn, and, and that's it. You're done, right? So there's always in discrete time like this, you always end up with like n states and n minus one controls. Although here, right, you actually, if, if we take x1 out, then it's n minus one states that are actually decision variables. But everyone cool with that? Yeah. So the result is also n that are n minus one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just alternating Qs and Rs such that it lines up with that vector Z, right? Uh, so all the time steps are stacked. Okay, so that's cool. Now we're gonna define some more matrices. Uh, this matrix C and this vector D such that the dynamics uh, are a linear, uh, one big linear constraint function. So that's going to look like this. So I essentially, I just want to write the dynamics down for the whole trajectory kind of as one big matrix equation. So that looks like the following. And this is, so you, this is minus identity, just to, to be clear. Uh, and then we're going to have zero A, B minus I. Um, the idea here, and then the rest of this is zeros.
And then uh, you're going to kind of keep doing this stuff. And then for the last time step, you're going to end up with like A n minus one, uh, B n minus one, and then minus identity again. And this whole thing is going to multiply your, your giant Z vector such that you get, so like this would be times, you know, u1, x2, u2, blah, 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 xn. And then this is going to equal, move this over a tiny bit. Uh, I'm not a fan of you right now. OK, so this thing is going to equal the initial state. Uh, like so, and then all zeros. So this is just me writing down uh, AXK plus BUK minus XK plus one equals zero for all the time steps and just kind of stacking that up into a big matrix equation. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. So this is just how I write down the dynamics for all the time steps, sort of in this like giant stacked matrix setup. Cool. So we're going to define this guy um, as we'll call this one C and this one D. And this one obviously is our Z from before. Okay. So now we have the entire LQR problem as a standard form QP. So in particular, right, we're doing min over Z of our cost function, which now is just this nice quadratic thing, subject to a linear constraint, which we could just write as CZ equals D. And that's it. That's the whole thing now, right? Looks like a QP, nice, really simple QP. We just have to set up the matrices. Uh, so if we kind of start like thinking about solving the QP. Uh, what, it, what would be my next move? Like maybe I wanna write down the Lagrangian of the QP and then write down some KKT conditions, right? So let's go ahead and do that. Hey Zach. Yep. In the C matrix, is everything below the second row on the left side of AN minus one just zero as well? So it's basically like it's almost block diagonal. So you're basically going to have, there's some weird stuff for the first time step, but then after that, it's A, B minus I, A, B minus I, A, B minus I, like kind of down the diagonal. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we got this guy. So I'm going to just have my original cost function plus a Lagrange multiplier times my dynamics constraint. I'm just gonna look like, for clarity here, I'll use the square bracket so it doesn't look like a C. C, Z minus D equals zero, right? So that goes right there. Cool. Now we take some derivatives and write down some KKT conditions. So we've got gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to Z is gonna be H Z from the cost term uh, plus C transpose Lambda, right? Cool, everybody. And then take the gradient with respect to Lambda. This is gonna be just the, the dynamics constraint. Oh yeah, and these, right, these have to equal zero. Okay, so what, uh, so how do we solve these KKT conditions now? Based on that, like everything we've done so far with optimization stuff. Okay, yeah, so Newton's method. Uh, how many Newton iterations do I need to solve this thing? Can anyone tell me that? 
Yeah, why? Yeah, so this is a linear system, right? It's a, uh, you could do that, or you could just use a direct, like it's just backslash, right? So let's write this down. So this thing, these KKT conditions. Right, uh, are, could you repeat what was said? We didn't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. So just the fact that this is a, a linear system of equations and you can solve it, you know, just like any matrix equation. So if I write this down in sort of like kind of your standard, basically if I stack this up into a matrix, right? And write down the KKT system that we're used to seeing for, for these problems, the matrix system, it just looks like uh, H C transpose, right? The top line is H C transpose times Z lambda equals zero. And the bottom line is C Z zero here, right? Times uh, uh, equals D, right? So that's it. This, it turns out here, right? The KKT system we're used to seeing in Newton's method, here it's exact, right? So I just have to solve that matrix equation one time. I get the answer. Pretty cool. Okay, so um, questions about this. So LQR is equivalent to a QP. Uh, it's an equality constrained QP. There's no inequality is the way we wrote it here, right? So if I write down the KKT conditions for that thing, the KKT conditions are a linear set of equations. They're a linear system. It's just a standard matrix equation. I can just solve it with backslash. You know, the way I like solving any AX equals B type problem, get the answer done, closed form solution. So that's one of the reasons it's so useful and powerful. Um, let's go look at that real quick and sort of compare that to some of the stuff we saw before. So here's the QP version of- Is it guaranteed for the system to be invertible? It is as long as you follow the, so this, this goes back to the Q semi-definite R positive definite stuff. Right? Okay, I see. So if those conditions hold, then- If those conditions hold, then this thing is guaranteed to be invertible. That's why those conditions are there. They make okay. they guarantee that this matrix is full rank and invertible. Uh, it's not super obvious yet, but it will be pretty soon when we dig into this a little deeper. That good. sound good? Yep. Okay, so here we go. Um, same dynamics as before. Uh, 10 hertz, uh, whatever. This is all the same, 10 seconds, whatever. Same initial conditions starting at one meter. Same Q and R matrices. Uh, same cost function here. All this is the same. So now is where I'm building these giant matrices. So this is that big H matrix where I just have a block diagonal R, uh, Qs and Rs. I'm playing some tricks here. This is like one of my favorite little tricks is using Kronecker products all over the place to build sparse matrices. If you haven't seen this before, I'm happy to talk about it in office hours or like you can Wikipedia it. Big fan of Kronecker products. Okay, so this is, but this is basically that block diagonal R, Q thing. Uh, what else we got? Okay, so here's that um, big constraint matrix. Again, it's just like, you know, it starts, the first row is weird because X1 isn't a decision variable. So it's just B minus I. So that's what this is, right? But then after that, it's just AB minus I, AB minus I all the way down the matrix, right? To sort of glue together all the time steps. And then that D vector is just minus A times X naught. Uh, I guess I, I should have kept that consistent, X naught, X1, and then all zero. So this is exactly what we wrote down before. And then uh, here, here we're gonna just solve that linear system. So here's um, the big uh, KKT matrix. So HC transpose C bunch of zeros. And then here's the right-hand side vector. So zeros and then D on the bottom, just like we wrote down. I solve it with a single backslash, right? Uh, just like X equals B. I'm gonna call that big solution vector Y here. And then I'm just gonna pull out the pieces from inside Y. So remember the Y is, is the Z and then the Lambda stacked, right? So here I'm pulling out the Zs. Then I'm gonna reshape it to pull out the individual Xs and Us. This is just index tricks to pull out the individual Xs and Us at all the time steps. And then the bottom of that uh, Y is the Lambdas, the Lagrange volt, which I'm not even bothering with here. Um, but that's pretty much it. So 
one linear solve. And then here we go. I get the, the same answers I did before, um, but this doesn't need any iterations. It's a one shot and done situation. Uh, and it gives me the exact answer to machine precision. It was like way more reliable and, and robust and all that good stuff. Uh, what else is in here? And then if we go look at the last one, we can kind of compare, make sure I do it the same way. So it was like 10 seconds. And these guys should be back to what they were before. Let's see how we did here. If I go kind of compare the answers. This obviously it takes a lot longer. And that's sort of not what you want to do in general. So a couple thousand iteration, but yeah, like 6.5658 or something like that. 6.658. So they match up to like three or four decimal places. That's pretty good. But obviously here we had like kind of loose tolerances and whatever. So this is not exact. It's good to four or five decimal places. It's pretty good. Uh, but this is the exact answer. Uh, you want me to try anything? Suggestions? Should do anything? Questions, comments? Yeah. I assume you can compute them faster at like longer time steps. Uh, yep. So we can try that. You want to try taking big steps here? I'm going to try like H equals, I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was saying compared to shooting ah. or longer time horizon, the QP can compute them faster. Yeah. I mean, basically, always the QP is way, the way to go. Like, basically, never do the shooting thing. There's not really a good reason to do it. Yeah. So is it common to say costs yeah, so you, you have flexi total flexibility there. Uh, I would say it's fairly common to, yeah, to pretty much have constant Qs and Rs um, there. I mean, it's a tuning game you can play if you want to shape the behavior. It's pretty common to have a different QN, a different terminal cost for the end, and then a different Q for the stage cost. But otherwise, yeah, like, um, generally speaking, when we kind of like pick these things, it's pretty forgiving. And most of the time we use diagonal matrices and just, you know, you can play some play around. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the cost shaping, cost tuning stuff and like kind of some rules of thumb for that. Yeah. <coughs> the matrix C which you explained. So are there any properties which could really be different? So the earlier matrices, we could always comment on the eigenvalues. Yeah. So for C, are there any specific parameters that it must fit into, or is it? I don't think so here. No. There's probably some rank conditions that it should have, but they're. I don't think those are super interesting. Um, the full KKT system here uh, has to satisfy kind of this quasi-definite property and full rank and all that good stuff, which get satisfied as long as Q and R are appropriate. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about it for that. Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm curious, like the limit program multipliers, do they help with the Yes, this is a good question to ask. There is a longer, much longer story about the Lagrange multipliers that it's gonna take a, a like at least another day to get to. It's coming. The Lagrange multipliers are, are very interesting and have lots of interpretive stuff to talk about. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, is um so if you have like a system like the quadruped from the homework with yeah. seventy two states, um, and if you're simulating that for a high time horizon, I imagine these matrices are going to get really large. They do, yeah. These can get huge. It's not uncommon to have like ten thousand variables in these things. So we just like break up the problem into smaller and smaller multiplications. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that next. So basically, like what we right now we just set up this giant matrix. But if you notice, when we set it up, it's super sparse, right? It's like mm -hmm. pretty much like almost block diagonal inside the blocks. So what we're going to do next is actually dig into that block structure and show how to solve this super efficiently. Um, so it turns out there's magic structure in there that lets you actually uh, solve this really fast, even for really long time horizons. Sweet. All right. So, yeah. So you're just, it's the Z vector. It's just X1, U1, X2, U2, whatever. You just stack it all up. Okay. And then you just, the C matrix is just built 
you know, with those A's and B's stacked, like, so that it works out with however you stack up. This is arbitrary, right? You could have stacked that up a different order if you wanted. You could have put like, yeah. you could put could have put all the X's first, then all the U's or something like that, in which case that C would have looked different. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't really, it's pretty arbitrary. We stacked it this way per time step because of what we're going to do next. It's a little nicer. Um, yeah. As long as the Q's and R's all satisfy those definiteness properties, uh, it it will. There's sort of one other condition on the dynamics. There's some like rank conditions on those A's and B's too, but basically, as long as like as long as A is full rank, uh, actually, we'll we'll get into that next. So there, there's a there's a couple of other conditions, but essentially, the big one is Q and R are. Q's got to be semi-definite and R's got to be strictly positive definite. And there's one other condition, like sort of rank condition on the dynamics that we'll talk about in a sec. Okay. Um, let's see. I think that's it for that. Everyone good now? Okay, so moving on. What do we got now? Oh, I gotta move this thing out of the way. So, okay, let's talk next. We don't have time. We're good on time. Okay, so we sort of just as a note, so if you go back and look at this stuff in the code, we sort of did. Um, you can kind of compare. shooting in the QP solution. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna dig into the structure of that QP a little bit and pull out kind of a cool result. Okay, so, um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna write down like the actual guts of that KKT system for a really short trajectory. So for like three or four time steps, we'll just kind of write the whole thing out. So as we kind of said that, um, that KKT system is very sparse. Uh, and specifically this means it has lots of zeros with a, um, with a lot of structure. So uh, has anyone here like studied like algorithms for sparse matrices for solving sparse linear systems? Okay, cool, a couple of you. Has anyone done back substitution before for, like solving triangular systems? Okay, so this is like that flavor of, of trick basically. Um, it looks, it's essentially a back substitution trick. So if you've seen that before, it's like maybe that makes some sense. For those who haven't seen that before, uh, you can look it up if you want, but yeah, we'll, we'll do it uh, real quick. So uh, let's write this out explicitly for like a few time steps. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to kind of like cartoon these block, sort of the, that's the H block, right? And then the, the sort of C down here has like a B minus I, and then a bunch of zeros, and the next row has an A, B minus I, the next row A, B minus I. Okay, uh, should tighten that up a little bit. Okay, so that's the C block, and wherever I don't put anything as a zero, assume here, right? Okay, then the C transpose, you know, B transpose minus I, A transpose. B transpose minus I, A transpose, B transpose minus I. And then this last block is zero, right? This is our KKT system. And then I've got my giant Z vector of decision variables. So this is gonna look like U1, X2, U2, X3, U3, X4. And then I've got my Lagrange multiplier. So that's gonna be lambda two, lambda three, 
lambda four. And like we kind of talked about when we, we did the Pontryagin stuff, the indexing here is kind of arbitrary. I'm just picking, you know, how to index those things and there's some ambiguity and you could choose, you could choose to start at lambda one and go to lambda three or whatever, but um, that's just how we're doing it. Uh, and then the right hand side vector here in our case is gonna be all zeros over for this part. So I can like partition these guys as well. And then minus a x one zeros down here for the dynamics constraints, right? Okay, so that's the whole thing for a, like a pretty short trajectory. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna kind of like look at the, look inside the matrix and we're gonna look, we're gonna start by looking at the bottom most row. So if I kind of like pull out just this row, this, uh, this last equation says, sorry, when I say last row, I meant last row of that like last time step, you know, uh, you get the idea. So if I pull this guy out and write this one out explicitly, this says QN X four minus Lambda four equals zero. So this lets me remember our rank conditions. QN's gotta be, uh, well, we don't need that yet. Actually, I shouldn't say that. So this guy, I can just turn this around and solve it for Lambda four. Okay. So let me now go up to the next row. So you can see where we're going with this. We're going to solve this one for lambda four. The next equation has a lambda four in it. So we're going to substitute this in and like eliminate that. And then we're going to kind of keep working our way up and doing this back substitution kind of stuff. So the next one, is R U three plus B transpose Lambda four equals. So now again, I'm just, that's it. I'm going to now go plug in the, the line I just found for Lambda four into this guy. So this is R U three plus B transpose Q N X four. This thing has to equal zero. Okay. Next move. I'm going to plug in the dynamics uh, for X4. So if I do that, I'll write down first, I guess. So this is now gonna be R U3 plus B transpose Q N, plug in the dynamics constraint, A X3 plus B U3 equals zero. So this the move from here to here is Plug in dynamics for X4. So far, so good. So that thing has to equal zero. Now, um, from that row, all that's in that equation now is X3 and U3, right? So I can massage that equation around and solve for U3 as a function of X3. I do that, I get the following thing. Cool. And we're gonna call this giant matrix thing in front of the X3, K. I'm gonna call this uh, here, K3, because we're at time index three. Uh, so now if we keep trucking and we keep working our way up the matrix, we go to um, like the next, the next row, if I take this one. Pull this guy down. I get um, Q X three minus Lambda three plus a transpose Lambda four equals zero. I know Lambda four already, right? So I can plug that back in. Um, 
So if I do that, so this is now I'm going to plug in the dynamics again. Now I'm gonna plug in uh, this guy. Okay, so actually we should talk about this. So uh, this line here, I solved for U3 as a function of X3, right? So uh, thinking, putting our control hats on now, what is that thing? Hmm? Feedback. Yeah, it's a feedback law, right? So we now have a feedback policy that for a given X3, I can tell you for any given X3, I can tell you what the U3 should be. And it's a linear function, right? So that is the optimal feedback policy. It's just this K matrix. So I'm gonna kind of hold on to that. And down here now, uh, now that I've gotten to here, I can plug in the feedback law for, for, the, uh, for the U here, right? To eliminate the U. And get this thing to be, sorry, this is a little bit in the weeds, but uh, the answer will clean up really nice in a sec. So now we've got A transpose QN, A minus BK X3 equals zero. Okay, and now I've got an equation for lambda in terms of X. So let's do that. Okay, so now in this thing, we're gonna call this, uh, we're gonna call the matrix in front of the X here and the lambda equation. So remember in the, in the U equation, the matrix multiplying the state we called K, and we said this is a feedback policy. Here in the equation for lambda, the matrix multiplying the state, we're gonna call P, P3. Okay, and the message here is, now that I've got this thing, this says lambda three equals P three X three. This looks exactly like where I started this whole thing. I said lambda four equals Q N X four. So I'm back to where I started. It looks exactly the same, right? So if I called Q N P four, that's where I am now. So now I've got this like recursion in terms of K and P. I did like kind of one time step worth. I can now bootstrap this and go up the whole matrix like this by going back substitution and solving for K and solving for P. So let's write that down. And this is this part cleans up. So K and P. So this looks like we say at PN equal to QN. Then we do K sub K equals. The equation we derived up there, R plus B transpose P K plus one, B inverse B transpose P K plus one A. Then we've got the next, the P is Q plus A transpose P K plus one A minus B K. And we can just do this and go the whole way back. So we start at time step n, and then we can find k's and p's all the way to uh, time step one, right? We go backwards. Uh, does anyone know what this thing's called? This set of equations that I just, this recursive solution to that QP has a name, it's kind of famous. Yeah, this is called the Riccati equation of the Riccati recursion.
Does this still work for uh, time varying dynamics too? Yeah, exactly. So I did this just for la you know, avoid so much bookkeeping. Um, but yeah, you can put K's on everything on the A's, B's, and Q's and R's in there, and it's and it's time varying. Yep. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about this for a sec. So what we did here, right, is we kind of stared at the QP and found this nice sort of blockwise recursive factorization trick for solving the QP one block at a time while not even having to like form the whole giant matrix and deal with all the zeros and all that other stuff. So that's cool. Um, there's two really big deal takeaways from this. The first one is that by solving the QP this way, uh, so, so what I can do here to say, to solve the QP like we just did uh, with the, the giant matrix version, I can do this matrix trick. I can go backwards and solve for Ks and Ps, and then I can start at X1 and roll out forward to get the, uh, the Xs and Us for the whole trajectory, right? So let's write that down. So we do basically a really a backward Riccati recursion, which you can think of as a backward pass, backward substitution, right? It goes backward in time. And that'll get you all the states it controls, right? Uh, so first question is, when I solve the giant QP like we did before, do you want to know what the complexity of that is? Like, what's the complexity of solving a, a linear system? You remember this? How many flops does it take or whatever, depending on the size of like X? Isn't that N cubed? It's cubic, yeah. So it's like, if we have, so in this case, right, where we have n big n time steps and then little n states and little m controls, can anyone tell me what it is uh, for that? So it would be just order big n number of time steps, right, times little n plus little m cubed. So it's, oh, sorry, it's, it's everything cubed. Okay, so it's just the whole thing. Do this right, yeah. Okay, so cubic complexity in the time states controls everything, right? For solving that big QP. What about this Riccati thing? What do we think? I mean, don't guarantee but I know like the best part of solvers are like order like one to the X. So this, so it depends. So turns out, there, you can do slightly better than cubic for general dense matrices with really crazy stuff. But it's like order, it turns out for general dense, it's like 2.67 or something crazy like this, a little less than three. The, the trick with all of this stuff is taking advantage of the sparsity structure. So just thinking about the thing we wrote down there, uh, think about what it looks like in time. We have this thing we do, this set of operations, matrix operations. Don't forget about what the complexity of that is for now. Just think about it in time. We do the same thing at every time step and we have this kind of like subroutine that runs at each time step, once per time step, right? So what is the time complexity of that Riccati thing have to be then? Sorry? And then just smaller plus So So just thinking about the time for a sec. It's linear in the number of time steps, right? Because we just do that single block like this block up here, uh, we just do that once per time step, right? Yeah. So whatever that costs, cool. I just have to do that n times. So it's linear in that. Um, so it turns out that if you kind of look inside there, we're doing like matrix inversion and matrix multiplication. That's like kind of little n and, and little m. So it's still cubic in the states and controls, but it's linear in time now, which is a huge, huge deal. Um, and it turns out that result carries over to like the more general nonlinear case when we do Newton's method.
So there's something special going on with the sparsity structure of the optimal control problem that the Riccati thing is exploiting, basically, by being super clever about how you factorize, how you solve that linear system, and kind of walking up the blocks in the kind of the way we just did. Uh, if you, you can think about this, right, is it just a clever sparse matrix factorization? Um, there's more to it that we're going to get into, but it kind of like um, gets you this order big N instead of order big N cubed thing, which is a huge, huge win if you're talking about long trajectories. Uh, so, okay, so that's one big takeaway is it's linear time uh, instead of cubic now. The other major takeaway is uh, when we did this, we went backwards and we saw for these Ks and Ps and whatever. We talked about kind of very briefly there, um, these Ks, they're a feedback policy now. So in particular, when I do the backward pass here, there's no actual particular state in there at any point in that backward pass. There's no state in there until I get to time step one, at which point we said, you know, if you want the trajectory like you had in the QP, you plug in X1 and then roll it out with the Ks in there. So it turns out here, we've gone from having this like open loop solution to the QP, which is just for a particular X1. I saw this big linear system. I get out a single trajectory answer. Now I've got a feedback policy where I have these K matrices that are good for any state that I want to try it on. So if I, if I do this factorization backward once and get these Ks, I now have the optimal feedback policy, the answer for any state. I can now go roll it out with any X1 I want and I'll have the optimal solution for any state as if I had resolved that whole QP, right? But now I just have to do matrix multiplication and like I have this feedback policy, which is also a really cool, interesting thing. Um, arguably more important. <laughs> Okay, and now uh, we're gonna go do this. Any questions while I kind of switch it up? Yeah. This feedback policy is stabilizing, like it's a policy to stabilize the local rate system. Yeah. So it turns out in, you know, this is kind of magic right now. Uh, the, I, can sol I can give you the answer to that QP for any X naught uh, in the form of these K matrices that like you just plug it in, do matrix multiplication, and that's the optimal answer to that control problem, that trajectory optimization problem, as if you went back and solved that optimization problem every time. But now I have this like closed form answer to it, right? Which is really special and, and really cool. And there's basically like no other problem in control that has this kind of like super clean closed form feedback policy solution. Uh, which is one of the reasons this, this thing's so awesome. Okay, so let's go do this. Uh, okay, so same dynamics, same exact setup, 10 hertz, 10 seconds, start at one zero, same cost matrices, cost function. Okay, here's my Riccati thing. So P's and K's, all zeros, start at the end, QN, and then I'm gonna go backwards from time N to time one. Uh, and this is just what we wrote down, right, uh, in the notes. And then, so I, I solve for all the Ks and Ps backward, and then I do a forward rollout where I start at X naught, and then simulate U equals minus KX, right, and then plug that into the dynamics AX plus BU and go forward. So that's the whole thing. And now I can go plot this stuff, whatever, and you'll find, I don't know, like evaluate the cost. And this, if I look here, it looks like what we had before, and like, if we actually look at this number, uh, uh, as long as I didn't mess up with anything over here, these should match exactly like to machine precision. Let's take this and dump it in here. I think they match, yeah. Yeah, so they match all the way to, to double precision floating point, which is pretty awesome. So we get the exact solution to the QP. Um, and now we have this like cool feedback policy thing. So let's try some, some interesting stuff with this. So the first thing I want to try is, um, like we said, we have this feedback policy now. I, I can cache those K matrices, and now I can do the rollout with any X that I want. 
and I don't have to resolve the problem. So here, let's do like a random X naught. Uh, so yeah, random thing here. Uh, we'll roll it out and look at the answer. Right, totally different, you know, initial state, whatever. Optimal solution does the right thing. Uh, like if I had resolved the QP, different cost, whatever. The other interesting thing I can do here uh, is if I kind of go back to my original X naught here, um, I can add noise to the dynamics. Like if I'm, like as if I'm, you know, disturbing the system online in, in real time. So like I can do that here. I can add on some like random noise uh in the rollout right and this thing will provide stabilizing feedback so you'll see here right it wiggles around a bunch but this thing is now going to regulate this thing near the origin uh and reject all the disturbances right so it's a, it's a really nice feedback policy did someone have a question okay um you can see what the controls are doing here that's kind of cool uh what else is there to say about this okay any any questions any requests let me try something yeah cool. no, I have a question. So, uh... The K is always there. Work. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that next, actually. It's coming up. Yeah. Yeah, sure. 100 seconds? No problem. So this is, uh, you know, so it goes to the origin. You know, it was already there, right? So it's just zeros. I can add the noise back in there. And that'll now regulate it super nicely right to the origin uh, with the noise. Should be kind of cool. We can look at that. Pretty good, right? Um, so what'll happen here is if I add more noise, it'll wheel around more, but it'll always keep it nicely sort of regulated, stabilized to the origin, right? Um, so you get this initial transient and that's just you know fighting the noise basically, right? Uh, other requests? Let me try something. Yeah. So here it is Gaussian. I because I called so this rand n is normal distribution. So I'm adding Gaussian noise here. Um, it can, I can add whatever I want to this, right? I can whack it any way I want. This feedback controller will always kind of push me back and stabilize the origin. Um, any other questions? Yeah. What about control errors? Control errors? Yeah. What do you mean by control errors? Uh, I mean, here it's, it doesn't really matter. So here I'm adding it to the X's. Uh, you want me to add it in, in here? That's, yeah. so this would be totally equivalent to me just putting a B here, right? Because it's linear. So, I mean, I can do that if you want. Yeah, it doesn't change anything. Yeah, so there's that. Um, okay, so the, we're almost out of time. So I want to show you one more cool thing, which is what you were getting out about changing the horizon. So check this out. If I plot, so the K matrix here, remember we start at time N, we go to time one. I'm gonna, and this system, it's two dimensional state, one dimensional control. So the K matrix is, is one by two, right? Multiplies two DX, spits out one DU. So I'm just gonna plot the two elements of the K matrix and let's look what happens. So remember we're starting at time N out here, but check this out. As I go backwards towards the initial time, these things asymptote out to constant values. That's interesting. So uh, it turns out for time invariant LQR, so the A and B constant, turns out this thing asymptotically converges to a steady state solution. This is called the infinite horizon LQR solution, meaning if you had infinite time, right? So we did finite time with, with some fixed n final time. Turns out if you just take n and make it kind of big and do this, you'll converge to some answer with some fixed feedback gain K. So most of the time when we do stabilization, like regulation problems, where we're just trying to track a fixed point and not trying to track a trajectory, we just use the fixed infinite horizon solution. And you can solve that separately. Uh, there's actually a function in the control toolbox or in MATLAB, whatever you like. Uh, this is DLQR for discrete time LQR. In continuous time, it would be just LQR. You give it A, B, Q, and R, and it will spit out uh, the, the, the asymptotic answer. And we can kind of compare this to our solution. Uh, and for, yeah, you can see it agrees like pretty much exactly because uh, we went out so far. So we basically were at the asymptotic value. Uh, we can do this, we can repeat the rollout thing with the constant value. 
and you'll see it basically gives the same answers. Uh, we can do it with noise, whatever. So in general, if you're just doing fixed point stabilizing, you can get away with just using the fixed constant infinite horizon K. Uh, and I think we're out of time, guys. So I'm happy to hang out though and answer more questions. Is this pretty much just like getting games for inventory? It is, yeah. It's exactly PD feedback, right? You've got a, if you look at that X vector, it's got the position and velocity. So it's literally a PD controller. Yep. But it is in some sense the optimal PD controller, right? And in general, it's time varying. So it's a little bit more complicated than your like vanilla PD controller. But yeah, the end game here is a, at least if you define your state to be position velocity, it's going to be a PD, PD feedback.